Good evening, everyone. My name is Brother Govindananda, and a very warm welcome to you all, whether you're joining us here at our Guru's Fullerton Temple, it's about an hour south of the Mother Center, or whether you're joining us from one of our centers and groups around the world, or joining from the comfort of your own home all around the world. Welcome. So we have a very deep subject this, more, this evening, loyalty. It's as deep, it's as deep as it gets. But the very first thing that I want to say to us all is, let's just relax, because the truth is, we're already doing it, aren't we? Everyone here is loyal almost by definition. Why? Because you're here. There is no time in the ultimate sense, so you're loyal now. We're loyal at all times. The whole story of creation is that God has created you and wants you to go back to Him. And loyalty is what allows us to travel that path to the very end. Loyalty is God's master plan for getting us back to Him. And that is why, as most all of you know, that Paramahansa Yogananda said, Loyalty is the highest law. Of course, we can talk about loyalty to many different things. Loyalty to family, to country, to humanity, to the world, to our employer, to our employees if we have them. But we're here to talk about the loyalty that takes us back to God. So this evening I wanted to break this subject down into four parts. First, I wanted to discuss the very deep spiritual reason why loyalty is the quality that can ensure we find our way home to God. Secondly, because it's good to be aware of what can test our loyalty as we follow the spiritual path, we'll talk about the challenges of this particular moment in the world's upward evolution. Thirdly, we'll talk about what we can do to develop our loyalty, to ensure we overcome the inevitable tests that will come our way. And fourthly, well, I wondered whether I should really cover this one final point about who ultimately benefits from our loyalty. But I feel we have to. I feel compelled to. It is we ourselves, we ourselves as souls, that are the ultimate beneficiaries of our loyalty to God the guru, and the spiritual path. Now, one of the beauties about loyalty is that it allows us to take our minds off ourselves, ourselves as egos, that is. And what a relief that is. So it can be, I don't know, deflating, or maybe even perilous, to, to think that loyalty is ultimately to our own benefit. We have to be careful with this. I say perilous because I'm sure that some of you, at least, will remember the time that two dogs and a cat died and went to heaven. And <laughs> mm, it, it happens. But, <laughs> but before they were given permission to stay, God thought it would be a good idea to interview them. So God first turns to the Labrador and says, what do you believe in? And the Labrador said, I believe in discipline and loyalty to my master. And God said, very good. Please sit at my right hand. And then he turns, God turns to the retriever and said, What do you believe in? And the retriever said, I believe in loyalty and protection of my master. And God said, Very good. Please sit on my left side. Then God asked the cat, <laughs> What do you believe in? And the cat replied, I believe that you are sitting in my seat. <laughs> That really happened. So, so now I want to read a couple of verses from the Gita, just to switch it up a little bit. And I'm going to read these fast. And I, I don't want you to like say, what is he saying now? These are complicated verses. And I'm, and, and I'm going to deliberately go through them fast. Let man uplift the self, the ego, by the self. Let the ego not be self-degraded, cast down. Indeed, the self is its own friend, and the self is its own enemy. 
If you're confused, that's good. <laughs> for, for him whose self, ego, has been conquered by the self, soul, the self is the friend of the self, but verily the self behaves inimically as an enemy toward the self that is not subdued. Uh, maybe it's just me, but I imagine Vyasa laughing to himself as he wrote these verses, like, like he knew the confusion they might cause. And I can tell you, having read different translations of the Bhagavad Gita before our Guru's commentary on the Gita came out, and that's God Talks with Arjuna, before that was published, there is lots of confusion out there about those verses. And we have worked to understand what is meant here, but again, I'm not going to try. The point I do want to make is that there are times in our lives that it can be very difficult, perhaps even impossible, for our egos to determine the right way forward. And I think the difficulty in these two couplets illustrates that difficulty in a way that nothing else could. Like, what's going on? Is it myself? Is it my ego that Vyasa is talking about? So what can we do? We can find a guru and a spiritual path, and then just be loyal. Loyalty is the superpower that will allow us to decide which way to go when we get to these critical junctures in our lives. So those are the four aspects of loyalty I want to cover this evening. But let's, we should have a dictionary definition, it's always good, or often good. Here it is. Loyalty implies a faithfulness that is steadfast in the face of any temptation to renounce, desert, or betray. None of those words are very important. Faithfulness, steadfast, in the face of any temptation. And uh, what makes loyalty so interesting is that we're living in a world that seems designed, is designed, if we want to know the truth to make us be anything but loyal. It makes for great stories, but, but immense heartbreak too. So the first part, why loyalty guarantees we will find God. In her talk, The Guru-Disciple Relationship, Marinalini Mata says that ego, which is the consciousness and self-assertion of the little I, you know, I think we all know what's meant here, is, is the one thing that keeps us from God. Banish the ego, and in that moment one realizes he is, ever has been, and ever will be one with God. The ego is a cloud of delusion surrounding the soul, veiling and diffusing, remember those words, veiling and diffusing its pure consciousness with endless misconceptions about the nature of oneself and the world. One effect of the ego delusion is fickleness, as the truth-seeker begins to manifest his divine soul qualities, he banishes this unreliable tendency of human nature and becomes a loyal and understanding person. These two words, veiling and diffusing, that describe how the ego surrounds the soul and making us misunderstand everything. These two words hold hidden depths and are the key to understanding why loyalty is the highest law. In Mejda, which was written by Paramahansa Yogananda's brother, Sananda Lala Ghosh, there's a transcript of a talk in which our guru said, when the yogi in meditation converges the gaze of two eyes at the kutasta, the spiritual eye, the point between the eyebrows, and concentrates deeply, a light will appear. In the center, a dark spot or area will form, which is known as the Brahmari Guha, Cave of Honey. It is surrounded by luminous rays, a manifestation of the creative vibration of Om, and protected by two powerful forces, Avaran, a veil-like power, and Vikshepa, a scattering power. As the devotee tries to concentrate on this manifestation at the spiritual eye, it vanishes. Vikshepa deflects his gaze and scatters his attention, and Avaran casts a veil of delusion over his perception. You know, and we've all had this experience in meditation. Maybe we see something, but, it's, but then it goes. Or, or we just can't keep our gaze steady at that point. It can be very frustrating for some time. It's not just that we haven't 
learned, although you could say that's what's happening. It's not just, but, but we, have, we have to be patient because these are not trifling forces that disappear in a moment. In the holy science, Sri Yukteswar refers to them as a darkening power and a polarity power. And the first is the source of egoism and blind tenacity. Tenacity is good, blind tenacity, not so much. <laughs> and, and the second produces attachment and repulsion to the objects of happiness and unhappiness, also not good. So it takes time to wear down these powers of Avarn and Vikshepa. Time, effort, and steadfastness. So Mrinalini Mata is saying that as we follow the spiritual path, which we're doing, and our soul qualities begin to develop, loyalty will result, and the f these two forces that veil the spiritual eye and diffuse our concentration are finally overcome, and then we can enter the spiritual eye. And behind the spiritual eye, that's where we find the lofty kingdom of infinity, that our loyalty has unlocked. And we're already on our way. But before we get to that stage even, our, steadfast, our steadfastness on the path ensures more than just loyalty. You might remember that Mrili Nimot has said that as, fickle, that as fickleness disappears, we gain loyalty and understanding of how the world really works. And we also gain peace as the American philosopher Josiah Roy said, unless you can find some form of loyalty, you cannot find unity and peace in your active living. So that's why loyalty is the highest law from the spiritual perspective. That's what allows us to go home, metaphysically, through the spiritual eye. So, part two. What's our current situation? Sit rep, I guess, they call it. Now, now we have to consider the state of the world in its upward evolution and the specific challenges of this particular moment in time. Because it's not all going to be smooth sailing. I don't know why I'm smiling. It's just, it's, I, sh I shouldn't be smiling. <laughs> there will be waves, and it would be helpful to get a sense of which direction they might come from. One of the monks told me of a three-week period in his early years in the ashram, and this was many years ago, that was extremely difficult. It was like a storm had broken out in his mind, in which all his past desires were combining to torment him. Finally, just when it seemed like the torment was at its highest, he slammed his fist down on the table in his room and exclaimed, Even if this lasts my entire life, I will not give up. He was doing it harder than this. <laughs> and immediately the storm broke, and the torment was gone. Try this at home. <laughs> Some days later, he had occasion to talk to Sri Dayamata about it, and she said, I knew what you were going through, and I wanted to help you, but Master wouldn't let me. Imagine, Master wouldn't let me. He wanted you to develop the strength to face your challenges. But from now on, you will have smooth sailing. Yes, there will be waves from time to time, but you will be fine, because now you have learned to sail. If you've read Sri Yukteswar's The Holy Science, or God Talks with Arjuna, you'll know that, again, this is in the grand scheme of things, we are in what the ancient Indian sages refer to as Dwapari Yuga, the second age of development. And how are things going in this second age? Well, various social commentators have, in the West at least, have characterized this moment of time as the age of addiction, the age of narcissism, the age of cynicism. I could go on, but it, does, it doesn't get better. <laughs> I, I, uh, I did not find anyone that suggested we're in an age of loyalty, unless it's, you know, brand loyalty, which is like <laughs> loyalty to stuff. Um, but Whatever the defining characteristic of this moment in time might be, it seems to be the near opposite of loyalty. There is such an abundance of stuff now to stoke our desires, some of which we could barely even imagine 30 years ago, that our ability to stick to one thing, our ability to be loyal, is being tested like never before. Now, 
it's probably true that people of all ages and times lamented the lack of loyalty in their own age. In fact, Matthew Ward, who's a research fellow at Nottingham University in England, he studies loyalty in medieval times. That's his field of study, you know. Medieval times, the age of chivalry and loyalty. But he notes that Christine de Pizan, an Italian-born French poet and writer, claimed that in her day, this is the early 15th century, loyalty was already a thing of the past. Writing, quote, of the little truth and fidelity that this day runneth throughout all the world. So let's go back earlier still, to the 13th century. Catalan mystic Ramon Lull, he said the same thing then. You know, no matter how far you go back, people are always complaining about the lack of loyalty. But even though complaints about the lack of loyalty maybe never change, can anyone seriously doubt that we're living in an age that tests our loyalties like, like never before? Brother Nandamoy, in his talk, Are We Really Entering a Better Age?, explains why, why this is so. And he said the influence of Kali Yuga, I'm quoting now, the first age, will be left behind as the years go by. But during this period of transition, there is great conflict between the tenacious Kali Yuga mindset and the more enlightened spiritual understanding struggling to be born. This is why our times are so turbulent. Even though it is true that we have entered a higher age, most people in action, in understanding, in attitudes, are still very much in the Kali Yuga. The focus of their concentration is outward, on body satisfaction, ego satisfaction, and we're trying to go in through the spiritual eye. Now, now, in the past, it seems that it was so obvious that a spiritual aspirant had to be loyal that it didn't even need to be mentioned. For example, if you have read God Talks with Arjuna, you'll know that each character in the Battle of Kurukshetra represents a particular spiritual or psychological quality. So, which character represents loyalty? None of them, at least, <laughs> unless I missed it. Um, <laughs> You know, and there's characters covering every sort of quality, uh, but not loyalty. And it's not even one of the 26 qualities of the self-realized sage. You mean know, 26 qualities, you think loyalty would be in there? It doesn't need to be mentioned. It's, it's, it's taken for granted. Look at Sri Teshwar's The Holy Science, in which he elucidated the common foundations of scriptures East and West. How many times is loyalty mentioned? Not once. If loyalty is so important, don't you think it would be worth a mention? I think it's so important that the writers of these scriptures just took it as axiomatic. Does a driving manual start with the instructions to get in the car, in front, <laughs> behind the wheel? You know, it, like it reminds me of the man who called the police to say that a thief had made off with his steering wheel, his brake pedal, and his accelerator. The police came to visit, to check it out, and they found he had gotten in the back seat. <laughs> I, I, I once heard Brother Nandamoy say that he wished that our guru hadn't felt it advisable to add the vow of loyalty to the traditional monastic vows. You know, it's one of our, four, it's one of our vows as monastics. Perhaps he did so as a word to the wise, or as an acknowledgement that loyalty is going to be especially tested in this age. It just makes sense. When God sends a technique as powerful as Kriya Yoga, Maya, the world of illusion we're living in, has to up its game. Or else it was the other way around. So we have to respond in kind. It's, it's high drama, folks. <laughs> so now, now, now along comes the world to test our loyalty. But we're expecting it, so we're ready. But Maya knows where we're weakest, what the best angle of attack is, or wind direction, if you're still thinking about that storm metaphor. A really brilliant attack is for Maya to make us feel that it is the guru himself that is causing our difficulties. This is, this is, this is next level, like they say. <laughs> Sister Gyanamata tells a wonderful story that captures this. She, she wrote to our guru, 
Some time ago, I read the life of a saint called the Sage of Sakori. It was very interesting, and because of one important incident, it will always stand out in my memory. This guru sometimes threw stones at his disciples, not playfully, but in anger. Those who, with devotion, picked up the stones and carried them home found that they had golden nuggets. Those who left them lying on the ground missed the blessing. I had read all the lives of the saints that I could get, Ganamata writes, but found nothing similar in them. An outstanding and marvelous truth was taught by this incident. If the guru, quote, throws a stone, that is, assigns a duty or gives an order that is disagreeable and painful to the disciple, the attitude in which he receives it and performs it determines whether he shall receive the blessing or not. If he, quote, picks it up and carries it home, that is, receives it humbly and carries it out cheerfully, he will find he has a golden nugget. All depends upon his attitude. Brother Anandamoy tells the story of planting trees at the lake shrine. You, you know the story. There was a new fellow helping out one day, and the master told him to put one of the plants in the ground with the roots up. Well, that was all he needed to hear. You know, this man left, and he never came back. You know, <laughs> we can laugh at the story, you know, after 70 years, because we weren't there, you know, and, and it was told through the perspective and understanding of Brother Anandamoy. But how would we have responded if it was us? You know, I, I ask myself that. And I've been on the path long enough to have known a few individuals that have gone through experiences like this. Very tough. It's not my place to tell their story. But they didn't give up. And it's an amazing thing. Words can't capture it. In his lesson on the guru-disciple relationship, Yogananda says, spiritual force comes from single-hearted dedication to one path. Anything less is a travesty of love and loyalty. Spiritual force. And you can practically feel this spiritual force coming from devotees who have passed such tests. They've changed. Speaking of throwing stones, but very much not an example of a major spiritual test. Many years ago, while I was working abroad, I was passing a, drive, a, a driving range while walking home after work. It was Lahiri Mahashaya's birthday. I was practicing the presence and feeling pretty good. And uh, all of a sudden, a golf ball flies through a gap in the fencing and comes this close to whacking me on the head. I mean, I could actually feel the rush of air as it passed by my forehead. All practice of the presence stopped. <laughs> now, either, either I can't remember exactly how I reacted, or I don't want to tell you, but, but I, I, do, I do remember thinking, Lahiri Mahashaya, how could this have happened? <laughs> now, now, if it had happened to someone else, it would have been their karma or mass karma or whatever, but this was just unfair. <laughs> and, and, you know, maybe it was unfair. Fairness would have required the ball to hit me. I mean, I, you know, I <laughs> but I got over it. It was a small thing, but the point is the same. When life blindsides us, the trick is to not get lost in the how could this have happened, but to get back on track as soon as possible. So part three, developing loyalty. Will we have what it takes when our moment to be tested comes? Yes. We can ensure we will be ready by taking whatever loyalty we already have, and it is a lot. And again, just, just by being here, it's a lot already and just making it deeper. In one sense, every spiritual effort we make leads to an increase in loyalty. One of the monks that served in Sri Dayamata's office for many years said that one day Ma told him, the highest expression of spiritual loyalty is putting God first in all your challenges, decisions, and experiences. Loyalty, in a sense, is the very movement of life itself. Now, many people today have lost faith in institutions of all kinds, and it's not hard to see why in some cases. These individuals feel their loyalty to these institutions has been misplaced 
and their trust abused. But the loyalty we are talking about developing now, here this evening, is intrinsic loyalty. If your loyalty to an institution has been misplaced, that does not diminish you. Although you might need to choose better in the future. But we must not give up on loyalty itself. Sister Gyanamata put it in these words. Apply the acid test to your own character. Have you faith? Not. What have you faith in? But have you faith? Are you capable of loyalty? How far will it carry you? And then she invoked the blessings of those great ones that have proven their loyalty down the ages, praying that they bestow upon us a little of their own courage and faith and loyalty, so that we do not need to search for truth outside ourselves, because, as she said, truth will live in us, manifest through us, and lead us to unimagined heights, since, now quoting the Bible, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but the victory is unto him who is faithful. But, again, allowing for the fact that every spiritual effort we make contributes to our growing loyalty. This evening, let's highlight a few qualities or practices that might be especially helpful. You might come up with a different list, you know, if you thought about it. An excellent question to ask yourself is, what do I think would strengthen my loyalty? I was discussing this subject the other day with Brother Prophet Ananda, and uh, he said, uh, and I was telling him what I was think, what I was planning to talk about, and he said, "You've got to discuss non-attachment." And he's absolutely right. And I didn't have it on my list, but it's absolutely essential. So whatever is on your list, one thing is for sure: loyalty develops by putting our beliefs to the test of personal experience. In his talk, in, in Journey to Self-Realization, our guru explains, what is needed is investigative belief with sincerity and reverence, followed up with persistence in true beliefs, or at least in those beliefs that constantly manifest convincing results. Through the aperture of patience, drop by drop, the chemical of truth enters and crystallizes such belief into solid faith. But unless belief is founded on truth, it will not sustain the conviction that produces progress toward faith. But the result of faith is the stable quality or state of faithfulness, fidelity, loyalty. So that's how we get to it. It's by putting the teachings into practice. And again, this evening, I'd like to suggest four practices or qualities that will help develop our loyalty. One is doing the hard thing. Two is service, three is gratitude, and four is non-attachment. So doing the hard thing. Brother Premamoy stated in his talk, bringing out the best in our relationships with others, loyalty begins where convenience ends. He said, it is easy to be loyal to someone who is in everybody's good graces, it is not so easy when things start getting rough, but that is the test of real loyalty. Back when I lived in London, one of the devotees at the London Centre, uh, she paid a visit to Mother Teresa's centre in Calcutta. And she did meet Mother Teresa, but it was just for a fleeting moment. But, you know, like five seconds. But what Mother Teresa said to her has always stuck in my mind. It's, it's almost like Mother Teresa was like traversing a room and just pointed at her and said, always choose the hard thing. That was it. And uh, it always stuck in my mind, you know. If you have five seconds to tell somebody something, what are you going to, you know, what are you going to tell them? Always choose the hard thing. But our guru acknowledges that the spiritual path is not easy. So the good news is we've already chosen the hard thing. <laughs> but... But he also says that the worldly path is much more difficult. And the worldly path means to continually be driven by and to succumb to our material desires. Of course, it, you know, we all know it's fine to enjoy things, but it can easily get out of control. Especially, again again, with the sheer abundance and variety of what's available to us, at least in many parts of the world now. 
There have been a number of recent books discussing how this abundance of, of material goods and pleasures is playing havoc with our brains. And with one pathway in particular, the so-called reward pathway, which uses the neuromodulator dopamine, as most of you know. But apparently, the brain always seeks balance. And that's not entirely obvious, to be honest. But if we overstimulate the reward pathway, the brain reacts by adjusting receptor levels, etc., in a manner that we subjectively experience as painful. But if we do hard things, the brain responds by adjusting the receptors, etc., in the opposite direction, and we subjectively experience pleasure, or a sense of achievement, or accomplishment. And we all know this phenomenon. Our greatest achievements in life, the ones that give us the most pleasure, are usually the ones we've worked really hard for. So, if we want to experience a sense of pleasure and achievement that doesn't just pass away as soon as the desire for an immediate pleasure has been indulged, we have to do the hard thing. It's just, that's, it's as simple as that. But the even bigger payoff is this. When forward progress requires a, of us our steadfastness and loyalty, it won't be difficult for us because we've spent our lives training for these moments. We've learned the pleasure that comes from doing the hard thing. And we'll do what needs to be done. We'll be courageous. We'll be loyal. The next, the next thing I'd like to talk about, or at least just mention, is service. You know, we've, Brother Sevananda has covered this wonderfully already uh, this week, on Monday evening. Some people have a tremendous ability to do hard things, but it's in the service of their own egos. So to balance the ability to do hard things, we must be able to do them for others and for God and Guru. In other words, we must be able to serve. Loyalty to our ego is no loyalty at all. Think of that cat, okay? <laughs> cat got it wrong. <laughs> some years ago when I was residing at our Encinitas Ashram, I and some of the other monks were working with our devotees to put on a community event and I was discussing something with one of our senior monks, not far from a... We were close to a small work crew. And this crew was trying to do something. It shouldn't have taken a long time, but we could see out of the corner of our eye that things weren't going well, and the supervisor was getting frustrated. After a while, my companion said to me, let's go over, let's, let's see what's going on. We walked over and inquired. All of this devotee's frustration poured out. After listening, this senior monk just said simply, what if you did it all for God? You know, a stunned look came over the fellow's face. And then he looked a little embarrassment, but the frustration immediately disappeared as though it had never been. You know, you think, how long does it take to get over about a frustration? Well, maybe no time at all if we switch our attitude. So the next, next practice is gratitude. And I believe the practice of gratitude is an important protection against difficult tasks for two reasons. Firstly, from what I've seen, someone that has lost the ability to be grateful is someone that is at particular risk of losing their way. It's just a matter of time. Hopefully they will regain their ability to be grateful before the test comes, but ingratitude can be a very difficult spiral to pull out of. I think of the anchorite in the story that our guru tells in the lessons. God didn't come to him despite years of austerities, so he gave up in a fit of rage when Narada told him that God would come as soon as he had finished passing a a millions of elephants through the eye of a needle. And the anchorite, you know, but if the anchorite had instead been grateful that he had been able to, to lead, live a life, to lead a life dedicated to seeking God despite lack of results, he would have been able to understand that he was being tested and he would have been liberated, like happened to the other fellow. And secondly, why, why gratitude is, is important as a protection against losing our way. Again, studies have shown that gratitude is strongly correlated with measures of trust, cooperation, and other similar qualities. Now, I don't know how long you'd have to stay in a brain scanner to measure loyalty, you know, like your entire life. Um, but you can measure trust and cooperation, which, long continued, must surely look very like loyalty.
right? And finally, non-attachment. You can call it surrender. It's one of the core messages of the Bhagavad Gita. When the projects we're personally invested in get thwarted or shut down, these are the times we need to be on the watch, look out. Have we become attached to hoping for a successful outcome of our endeavors? You know, these are, this is when we can be at risk. We all know the feeling when this happens. We can become a bit reckless. We can say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, nothing matters anymore. We just feel that way for an instant or longer. You know, let's nip that in the bud. We all have the ability to recognize what's going on when our goals are thwarted. Resist the feelings of frustration that might result. And finally, just let them go. We, we've, we've got to let them go. It's, again, the, a core message in the Bhagavad Gita. Brother Paramananda told me that Sri Dayamata once told him, surrender is loyalty. Surrender is loyalty. I think what all these practices have in common is that they help to counteract the power of the desires that Maya is constantly trying to stir up within us. The solution is not to become desireless per se, but to be ambitious for God and for God in others. In many cases, we can continue doing the same things, but with a different motivation. Remember, the leader of the dark forces in the Bhagavad Gita is not king desire, it's king material desire. So, even as we try to move forward and become more loyal and steadfast devotees, we might still be dealing with guilt and shame of past disloyalties. This, this is common. What then? What do we do then? How do we let them go? It's a difficult place to be in. And one of the monks was once expressing this very idea to, to Sri Dayamata. He said, I, he said, I didn't do anything really bad before I came into the ashram, but there's a lot, there's a lot I wish I hadn't done. And Ma, but Ma shook her finger in his face very sternly. She said, stop, what's past is past. Yes, we have our karma, but your life started anew when you started the spiritual path. Do it to the best of your ability, and the past will be erased. Every moment of time is actually a new beginning, if we want it to be. And Sri Teshwar said, and he would sometimes tell new students on occasion, forget the past. The vanished lives of all men are dark with many shames. Human conduct is ever unreliable until man is anchored in the divine. Everything in future will improve if you are making a spiritual effort now. So let it go. And if, if we can't, you know, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, is there something in me that is wanting to hold on to this for some reason? You know, we, God has given us permission to let it go as long as we now move forward with faith. So now finally, we get to that truth which has to be handled with care that the primary beneficiary of our loyalty is ourselves. Not our egos, but our true selves, the soul. Along the way, again, we might have shown our loyalty to our families, our country, etc. To, to the guru, to the guru's organization. And all of them, no doubt, greatly benefit by our loyalty. But what can we give the guru who already has everything? The guru has nothing to gain except the joy of seeing us become liberated. And personally speaking, this, this particular truth is one that has worked for me down the years when nothing else has. If meditation is not going the way I'd like it to be going, if I'm not feeling any devotion, I have always been able to say to myself, it does not matter. I know who I am as a soul, I don't care how long it takes. And then I tell myself, do not expect to understand anything in your current mood. It's just like, it's not going to happen. <laughs> just just you know, keep moving. Before I came to our Guru's teachings, I had read about what are called the great sayings of the Upanishads, 
sayings such as, you'll forgive the pronunciation, Aham Brahmasmi, which is, I am Brahman, spirit, or Tatvamasi, thou art that, I am Atma Brahma, this self is Brahman. I understood them merely intellectually, and I wondered, and I don't mean this in an irreverent way, well, what makes them so great? Why are they great sayings? They're pithy, sure, they're, they're concise. Does that make them greater than other declarations of truth? But once I actually began to walk the path, then I understood the spiritual and emotional power and comfort that these great sayings can provide. Not just to the realized sages who have uttered them for literally thousands of years, but by seekers at all stages of the journey. In our Guru's commentary on the Gospels, the second coming of Christ, he wrote of, Yogananda wrote of Jesus Christ's utterance, I am he. He said, he wrote, the words I am he used by Jesus are a declaration of ultimate truth that has similarly been ecstatically realized and uttered by masterminds of India who lived before and after the time of Jesus. The Isha Upanishad says, that absolute self abiding in the transcendental effulgence, verily, I am he. Elsewhere in the Upanishads we find similarly the sacred truth affirmations, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, spirit, I am Atma Brahma, this self is spirit, and tatvam asi, thou art that. The scriptural mantra ahamsa or hangsa, literally, I am he, are potent Sanskrit syllables that possess a vibratory connection with the incoming and the outgoing breath. Thus, with his every breath, man unconsciously asserts the truth of his being, I am he. I have not emphasized the guru-disciple relationship this evening for a number of reasons. First, we have an entire class on the subject tomorrow evening. Second, I wanted the emphasis to be on what we can do to develop our loyalty. Many devotees come, many go. If we want to find God, we want to be the ones that know how to stay the course. And thirdly, now that we have talked about how important loyalty is and what it can do for us, now is the time to reflect on and consider for ourselves what it means to have, been, to have been sent a guru that can bring us back to God. And can we be anything but profoundly grateful? Sri Dayamata, talking to some of the monastics in her office once, she said, when we give Master our loyalty through our meditation, love and service, he will reciprocate sometime, somewhere. Earlier we spoke about loyalty being the key that would unlock the door of the spiritual eye. Sister Ambalika, a long-time SRF nun, told the following story. One day, it was before Master went out to the desert for the last time, the nuns gathered so that we could say goodbye to him. As I turned the corner of the building and came into his presence, this was at the Mother Center, I saw his big black eyes looking at me. Oh, there you are, he said. You've been asking me questions. And, and she had, mentally. So she said, I went over to him and he said, What do you want? To my chagrin, I heard coming out of my mouth, I want you to open my spiritual eye, sir. He shook his finger in the way he often did for emphasis. And he said, I'll open that spiritual eye one day. When I later told Diamata about that, she said, that's a promise. The thing is, as souls that are still trying to find our way home, we sometimes don't know what it is to be a friend to our own soul. More than that, there are times we can't know. But when we are loyal to the guru that God has sent and the path he brought, we realize for ourselves why loyalty is indeed the highest law. Confucius wrote, 
The scholar does not consider gold and jade to be precious treasures, but loyalty and good faith. In the words of our guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, God is equally present in all, but he is most definitely expressed in the heart of the spiritually minded, loyal person who thinks only of him. Through your loyalty to God, you can establish your oneness with him. Realize your soul's perfection. Be loyal as loyalty attracts the divine attention. When the storms of life gather and the waves of trials buffet you, guide the boat of your life safely to the divine shores by realizing his omnipresence. Guruji is guiding us along the path, perhaps carrying us at times, but he's counting on us to help. Jai Guru.